Don't cry for me, Argentina. Oh, you're <laughs> I'm very kidding. Very good with that. <laughs> But usually after that song, I cannot sing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host Oscar Fuchs, and we're back. It's 2020, and I've started the new decade with a stinking cold. And to make matters worse, I just realised that the medicine I've been taking expired in 2018. So if this episode ends up being the first and last of the year, then you'll know what happened. Luckily for me, in my recording with today's guest, the award-winning jewelry designer and maker Angie Wu, we introduced her very clearly right at the beginning of our chat. So I don't need to do anything else except to wish you a happy and healthy start to the year, and I'm looking forward to bringing you the rest of season one over the next few months, starting right now. Well, I'm here with Angie Wu. Angie is the founder of AWU Studio. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And first of all, what is AWU Studio?、Um, for now, it's a jewelry brand, and it's just my name. It's Angie Wu, so it's AWU is my abbreviation. It's a design studio. Excellent. And people will probably already notice your accent. But before we go into that, the first question I ask is, what object did you bring today? I brought a caliper. I brought this actually from Canada. Like I, this, this has been traveling with me. Everywhere since I was seventeen, so it's something that I have always used and I always carry with me, no matter where I go. I've actually never seen a caliper, so it's like a measuring instrument. Yes,、uh, you can measure the inner distance and outer distance. You can measure the thickness of anything, so it's really, really handy. Right,、mm. and presumably that there are now electronic or digital versions of the caliper,、mm-hmm. but you decide to use this version. Why? I have both, but I mean, I study with this, and I have a sentiment about it.、Mm. It's my first、um, professional tool in design, and it's always more precise when you when you use this. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you for that, and of course, this leads us into what you do, which is、uh, jewelry design, and you make everything yourself too. Yes, and the reason I brought the camera is also to illustrate that、um, for me, tools has always been. Something very special for me. I love tools. I love using tools. I love this magical transformation of making something out of another substance. So it's like this transformation.、Mm. And it's always been jewelry, or you've been doing other design before that. Actually, I studied design art in Montreal. So as a design artist, you mainly focus on the concept and the、uh, art concept, but you create design wells, so furnitures and. Any accessories, and that's how, how I start to use my calipers. And then I did a product design、uh, degree. I can design anything, even cars or dental equipments and stuff. And then I took a goldsmith class, and now I'm doing jewelry.、Yeah. Right. And you mentioned Montreal. So, is that your accent? It's not quite a Montreal accent, is it? No.、Um, My accent is really strange. A lot of people never like understand when they when people ask me where I'm from. I usually say I'm from Taiwan because that's where I was born. And then people will continue to ask me,、um, why do you speak so good English? I say, well, I'm Canadian actually too. I have a Canadian passport. And then I like, why do you have a strange like Latin accent in your in your English? And that's when I have to tell them that I also from Argentina. I actually grew up in Buenos Aires before we immigrated to Montreal. So we basically spent almost ten years in each country: ten years in Taipei and eight years in Buenos Aires and twelve years in Montreal. Before I moved to Spain, and then now in Shanghai. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more a Spanish accent, basically. It's my it's Spanish accent because that's my first foreign language. Yeah. Wow, I mean, I have some. Version of identity crisis myself. With I've got four grandparents from four different countries, but I think you maybe are a bit more confused than me. Even <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think ever since I left Taiwan when I was ten, I never not have an identity crisis ever in my life. And especially in Shanghai, it's really strange because you would think that someone who looks Chinese coming to China would integrate better. I actually suffer more identity crisis in Shanghai because local people don't see me as local, and Taiwanese people don't think I'm Taiwanese. They get super confused and they don't know where to put me in which category. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm the same. I used to be a headhunter for 11 years, and we like to put people into their compartments. And, and you're the person who I would not know what box to put in. <laughs> yeah, because people like to predict your behavior, right? right and right. they just don't know what to do with me. <laughs> yes. And so what happens when you go to Taiwan then? Is it the same story? Yes, it's, this is the strangest thing. Like, after leaving Shanghai, every time I go back to Taiwan to see my, my grandmother and my family, I mean, my relatives, they are really eager to tell me that I, I'm not Taiwanese. They think I'm Chinese. It's just super strange. I think it's because I've never stayed in a place long enough to form a very strong accent of anywhere. So I'm like a sponge. I absorb accent of anywhere I stay so I'm, I'm pretty sure I have some Chinese accent when I speak Chinese, but also I have a very strong Taiwanese accent. Somehow I don't even speak Taiwanese. So yeah, this is super strange. In Spain, they think I'm from Argentina. In Argentina, they think I'm from Spain. And when I speak French, French people think I'm Quebecois. And because I study Alianza Francesa, that's where I took my French when I was in Argentina. Of course, Canadian people, they can tell that I have Parisian accent. Super confusing. <laughs> but there was a reason I wanted to ask you that particular question, because where is home to you right now? I, okay, I always have this problem with defining home. Like, I used to think where my parents are and where my family is and where people I love are, but now they are everywhere in the world. So I recently I realized that home is where I am, is where my heart is. And I also came to the realization that your body and your being is the only person who is going to be with you for the rest of your life. So your body is your home and it's your temple and you should take care of it. So home is where I am. Nice. And I think you built on that concept, didn't you, with your jewellery? Yes, um, that was actually my first collection in 2014. I tend to make jewellery that are more conceptual and more artistic. Um, it's kind of a marriage of my two studies, like product design and fine art. So I like to make conceptual wearable art, um, like functional, but very conceptual, very artistic. So that collection is definitely not um, very representative of my work, but it, the meaning is so important. So I decided to create a very small collection of uh, the shape of a little house, of a necklace, earrings. And the idea is that when you wear that, you, it reminds you home is where you are. And when you give this away, it's like telling the other person home is where you are, where I belong. So it's a small collection, but it's very special. Well, that's a nice starting point to talking about your skills. Like, How would you say that you have progressed from that first collection to what you do these days? I mean, a lot. <laughs> it's been five years already. And of course, like with any skill, the more you do it, the better you are. And this is the really exciting part because now I'm making um, bigger statement pieces and incorporating more gemstones. Um, I only work with precious metals, so usually silver, gold, and platinum. But I, I am very excited about what I do because this is something I can improve for the rest of my life. And it's just really cool. <laughs> so tell me about some of your favorite recent pieces. Okay, so recently I have been working with our Wolf Diamond. It's actually diamond, but they're uncut and unpolished. And for me, there's no more precious material, less precious. Everything for me from the nature is beautiful and is variable. So you can give me a rock and I can convert it into some a beautiful jewelry. And for me, diamonds, okay, there's a value, of course, a market value, but I, it doesn't necessarily, for me, it's not the most beautiful stone in the world. So... I like this concept of that, the rough diamond, it doesn't look like diamond, but it is actually diamond. And I, I like to work with that and pairing with silver and I create like um, very um, interesting artistic pieces to also to challenge people to understand that uh, why, why is diamond, the shiny ones, spatial, you know? Everything can be spatial. Hmm. And so is that specific for the China market or do you think this is something which you could be doing wherever you are? I've never intended it to be local. It has always been international like me. And also there's another thing, my approach to design, I never um, think about my audience when I design, except when I do custom made because I do make a lot of bespoke like engagement ring and uh, wedding rings. But other than that, when I create my own collections and my artworks, 
I, I, it's just a self-expression. I don't, I don't think about the market. I don't think about the profitability. I create something that I want to express, but I do uh, apply everything I learned in product design about uh, economics, all these uh, size and uh, dimensions. It has to be functional. It has to be comfortable to wear, but it's my self-expression. Hmm. And so here in China, the, the customers who come into your studio, what is the breakdown in terms of the Chinese versus the non-Chinese? Half of them are Western people in Shanghai and half of them are Chinese. And the Western people tend to understand quicker and better my concepts. They understand these uh, conceptual designs. And Chinese people, they find it fascinating that it's so sculptural. Sometimes they don't understand what it is. And I always encourage them to try them on. And then they realize that... It's actually very beautiful. It fits them. And so it's very encouraging because it's special and unique. Yeah. Can you generalize in terms of what a, a Chinese customer tends to like more than a non-Chinese customer? Or is it hard to generalize like that? Okay, so, okay, there's two styles that's very prominent in my work. One is architectural style, like the very rational, structural, and linear and geometrical. And the other one is nature. My mom is a biologist, so I've always grown up in the nature. I love nature, so I work a lot with the element of nature, like leaves, seeds, um, all these organic uh, shapes. So the Western people, they like a lot of architectural styles and uh, linear styles. But Chinese people, unless they are architects or designers, they usually tend to like more the, the nature style. That's interesting. Mm. And so who is the real Angie then, you know, in terms of like what, what makes you tick? Yeah, so I'm a very nervous person and I like, I like to be alone a lot. This is something that most people would not expect from me. I'm, I'm, I love solitude. I need a lot of time alone. Uh, when I'm alone, I feel good. <laughs> but uh, when I am with people, I come alive and I, bec- I, I can be very outgoing and passionate. I, I think this is also part of me. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's where we're quite similar, because people would see me as very outgoing. I mean, look, I'm hosting a podcast, for God's sake. But um, I think I'm the same. Like, even if I have a party at, at my house, I will usually go into my room and close the door for 10 minutes <laughs> and then come out afterwards. Yeah, I need that balance in life. The, the, the time alone and the time with, when I'm with people, yeah, I always get too excited when I'm with people. <laughs> and I think when I'm with people, um, my Latin side come out. Oh. Yeah, like definitely <laughs> people can feel that. That's interesting. And then when you're working, is it the more kind of introvert side? Yes, I I like to work alone. And I think that's more the Canadian or the Taiwanese side. <laughs> I shut down and I like to immerse in my own world. Yeah. So where do you think the future will be for you? Do you think you'll stay in Shanghai? How long have you been here now for? If I tell you that, you can guess my age, but I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> I have been here for 14 years, and I will always keep my headquarters in Shanghai. It's where I studied, and I love uh, what has been going on. But definitely, I am going to be going back and forth and ideally moving to Europe first. Mm. European people really understand my work, like, really quickly. Yeah, and I don't worry about the market. And so, obviously, you've been very successful. But I want to ask you, where have been the biggest difficulties or even the biggest failures? I wouldn't call myself successful. I... (laughs) I, I'm doing better every year, so this is really good. It's very encouraging and very grateful to those who believe in me. Um, and the difficult part has always been the business. I, I was always trained as an artist and a designer. I've never deal with business. I'm very bad with numbers. So all, and all these legal things and paperwork drive me crazy. You know, for me... The only thing I knew is going to markets like in Argentina and Canada. You have this weekend market, designer market, and you say your work like a gypsy. That's what I, I know to do. And now my brand is more than that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Angie. It was great to have you here. That's, that's the end of our first part. And now we'll go on to part two. Okay, great. Thank you. Right, so the next part is I ask you 10 questions. So let's go straight into it. Question one, what is your favorite China-related fact? Okay, so the first time I heard this fact, I was fascinated and shocked. 
uh, Shanghai itself is around 26 million people. The entire Taiwan is no more than 23 million people. And this just blew my mind. <laughs> and I think that's just the official number. There probably are some others too, yes. right? Do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? Actually, I do, and I still cannot find the right English term for that. So when I grew up, my mom always, uh, my mom was a teacher professor, right? So she always cared about the inner beauty. She was always trying to use this word called qi zi. If you separate the word, it means the quality of your qi. It's like an inner beauty, a grace, and elegance. And it's something, my mom would say, it's something you cannot buy. You have to nurture it, you have to build it, and it has to be from childhood. So she always say, like, if you are someone with good qi zi, you will always um, benefit from that. Like, if it's outer beauty, it's something that doesn't last. So she always wants us to build this inner beauty, qi zi. Nice. Question three. What is your favorite destination within China? Definitely Yunnan. Um, I was designing museums before. Okay, that's what I was doing before my, my brand. I'm a museum designer. We build museums around the world, science and technology museums, children museums. And we built an uh, agriculture museum in, in Yunnan. So I've been there for three years going back and forth. It's so biodiversified and there are 26 minority in Yunnan itself. And it's just so beautiful, these um, native uh, local people, and they still make a lot of things by hand. They create their own um, tools and their jewelry, their, their accessory. They make them by hand, their clothes. This is so beautiful. I mean, it's the most exotic thing <laughs> about, about China. Yeah. And where was the museum? The museum is in Qijing. It's like two hours away from Kunming. Yeah. Right. But we had the chance to travel everywhere in Yunnan with the government, with the, the client. So I had the chance to see the beauty of Yunnan. It's amazing. You're making me very jealous. I've, I've only ever done a stopover in Kunming, um, but I, I really want to go down. But you have to have a good like week to go to all the different yes, places. And, sure. and even then, just the main places. There's so many other small places, right? Yes. Okay, well... I will swallow my envy right now and keep going. If you left China, what would you miss the most and what would you miss the least? I would miss the convenience <laughs> of this or uh, this app like Taobao, Alibaba, DD, like really like there's no place in the world like Shanghai. And what I would miss the least is the noise. I don't like noise in China. So yeah. Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? Uh, yeah, so recently I had a really bad experience. Like um, I have this studio that I built, my my jewelry studio in Jing'an Villa, like in, in close to Jing'an. And for five years, everything was great. I even just renewed the contract with them. And then out of blue, when I was in Italy doing my exhibition in April, the landlord just called me and told me he sold the building. So he wanted me out in one month. And he didn't honor the contract. For three years, he was telling me, oh, we trust each other. I like you so much. So I couldn't do anything about it. <sighs> Just when you think you understand how things work, everything's running smoothly, there's always going to be something that comes unexpectedly. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite place to go out, to eat, to drink or hang out? I still go to Malaba. I love the Spanish food there. And I go to Barbarian and Bar Centrale, Fat Cow. So these are the few places I go often. Yeah. Would you be able to choose one favorite? I really like Malabar <laughs> because of the Spanish uh, environment. But you know, I haven't been there. That's the one place you said that I haven't been. The food is really good and it's not overpriced. It's really good portion. It's not like really tiny tapas. So I will take you there next time. That's a date. Uh, what is the best or worst purchase you've made in China? I have to say the best. It's amazing. You know how humid is Shanghai, right? So I bought this machine. I discovered it by accident on Taobao. And it's actually a blower that connects to a blanket, like a double layer blanket with holes on it. So when you blow for one hour, you put this blanket between your uh, your bed and your mattress and your uh, to bed. And for if you blow it for one hour, it will eliminate all the humidity and the uh, dust mite because I'm allergic to all kinds of mites. So the bed will become fluffy, super like a dry, super comfortable. So I've been using that for the last eight years. It's really, really cool. Everyone should have that in Shanghai. Wow. What is your favorite WeChat sticker? 
Okay, so I got I actually change um, every month or every two months depending what I add new one. But recently has been this uh, reindeer that rolling like uh, on his back on um, waves. And it's, he's just rolling on this, looking super happy and comfortable. Yeah. That's cool because you actually do a lot of water sports, right? Yeah, I actually do. I do windsurfing and kite surfing. And this little reindeer just <laughs> remind me of my happy time by the beach. Yeah. And that's not far from Shanghai, right? No, it's only one hour exactly from Jing'an Temple. And it's a private club, but anyone can join. You can do SUP, um, canoe, windsurfing, sailing, and wakeboarding. It's really cool. If anyone wants information, can ask me. That's great. Next question. What is your go-to song to sing at KTV? So, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Oh, <laughs> you're kidding. I'm very good with that. <laughs> okay, so that loops back to our very first point on this podcast. So, that's because you're Argentinian, or at least one-eighth Argentinian. <laughs> no, but also because the song falls into my, my voice range, mm. and I can do that high pitch really nicely. But usually after that song, I cannot sing anymore. <laughs> but I love it. And also people know I'm from Argentina, so they love to hear me singing this song. That's how I impress people. And I just need that one song, and then I'm done. And finally, what other China-related sources of information do you use? To be honest, like um, I've been so busy the last five years uh, with this brand. I don't follow news so much anymore. So I have to tell you that like, my best resource for news is my assistant. She loves news and she's reading all kind of news all the time. So she's the one who always like uh, keep me updated of uh, what's going on with the world, with China and everything. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Wow, that's a really useful resource to have. She, she, yes. she is indispensable, obviously. For sure. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Angie. That was really interesting. The last question I ask everyone uh, on this podcast is, out of everyone you know in China, who would you recommend that I interview next? So you should interview Catherine. She's a healer. She's from Peru. And she does uh, workshops on cleansing. It's, it's really good for people who are living in Shanghai. We are always in a very stressful like lifestyle. Yeah. Wow, I've, I've never met a healer like that before. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting her. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. So when Angie mentioned her surprise at the fact that the official population of Shanghai is a few million larger than the population of Taiwan, careful listeners out there might have remembered that V from FitFam in episode 8 said the exact same thing about the population of Australia. So I looked it up and yes, Taiwan's population is 23.6 million and Australia's is 23.8. So there you have it, one city, one island and one continent, all with the same population more or less. I related very strongly to Angie's definition of home, so I really liked that meaning behind the jewellery collection that she made around this concept. Please check out the photos on social media, we're at Mosaic of China on Instagram or Facebook, or you can add me on WeChat using my ID Oscar10877 and I'll add you there myself. Alongside that collection, the second image I posted is some of her work with the unpolished rough diamonds. And the final image was a comparison between the architectural style preferred by Western customers versus the organic and natural style favoured by the Chinese customers. I looked up Angie's favourite word, qijie, and the translation I got was temperament or disposition. But there's something about Angie's direct translation, the quality of your qi, which just seemed to make more sense to me. If anyone out there has a better translation, then please let me know. I also uploaded a map I found of the distribution and population of ethnic minorities in Yunnan, which is fascinating since it's the most diverse province in China in terms of ethnic mix. Other than that, there is a photo of Angie with her object, the calipers. There's a selfie with me looking totally demented, I've got to say, but Angie looks lovely. Uh, there's a photo of her favourite restaurant, Malabar. There's an image of the bed humidifier, which was her best purchase in humid Shanghai. And of course, her favourite WeChat sticker, the swimming reindeer. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs. Extra editing support from Milo De Prieto. Artwork by Denny Newell and China support from Alston Gong. I'll see you next week.